Okay. Hi, Chris. Hey, what's up? Good morning, Kevin. It's been a while. Yeah, so, you've been up to a bunch of really interesting stuff since the last time we saw each other. I mean, it's been a while. And now this whole AI thing has just exploded on us just in the last month, at least for me in the you know public domain. Those two guys, I don't remember who they were, did that one hour meeting for the tech people that showed up. A lot of people are going, holy shit, this AI stuff is going to, one guy, what, he said, we, we should nuke any nation that really pursues it enthusiastically. Some people are saying it's the end of the world. Some friends of mine who are really deep in tech, one of them was a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, high tech, supercomputer company, and he's not that worried about it. Mark Anderson, who you both know, we both know, I think, kind of thinks it's not such a big deal. Is there a question and, in here, Kevin? Yeah. So just trying to set context. So here you are playing with it. So what's going on, Chris? Well, um, the explosion that I think you're talking about a month ago has to do with the release of those two new technologies, uh, GPT 4.0 and Midjourney 5.0. GPT is that text-based AI and Midjourney is the image-based one. And, um, you know, they've been around for a while, but they've been pretty clunky and technical and promising. But um, with these new updates that came out, uh, it really put the power of these AIs into the hands of common people. And I'm one of those common people. And so I just started messing around with it and trying to understand what was going on um, with this whole revolution um, you know, the first thing that really set me off was I started hearing about it from a bunch of different people who were non-technical using GPT for things that I had never imagined. Um, all different use cases, all unintended use cases, and all uh, amazing use of GPT. You know, one guy was using it to translate a 15th century Italian book. Another person used it to write a letter to their employer about maternity leave. I had another friend who's been languishing on a construction job site use it to categorize his uh, unfinished tasks and to communicate back and forth with his client about the, the work schedule. And it became apparent to me that we were like about to undergo some revolution here. And so I started tinkering. Um, I set up GPT and then I set up Midjourney on my own Discord server in a place where I can experiment in a semi-public environment with my friends. And so I've just been um, learning about creating prompts for these tools, which is how you interact with them. And um, yeah, I mean, it's fascinating time, Kevin. Uh, everything about my day job has changed in the last month. All the workflow of how I publish my podcast and write about it and promote it and stuff and how I interact with the community. It's all changed with these tools. And um, yeah, it's it's very fascinating, man. Chris, would you like to send a little context for some of this stuff? So for, for someone that doesn't know anything about this stuff, and I don't know if that's stuff you'd like to have contextualized, what in the hell is GPT and why is it an issue or why is it What's it do and what is, uh, maybe this for another time, you know, what is Midjourney and also who, who you are in your background and, and where you're going? Because you've been kind of, I think, sure. since, so I'll, I don't know. I'll try to keep that part kind of quick just because people can find that out there if they want to. Um, both these AIs that you asked me to set some context around, GPT and Midjourney, are called large language models. They've essentially learned how to understand English. Um, so that we can talk to them in very conversational and colloquial ways and they understand what we're talking about. So in Ch ChatGPT, I can say, you know, what are three things I should be thinking about in relation to my photography career that will be important to understand with the advent of AI? And it will return back to me some result. And then I can say, okay, point two is interesting, but I need you to tell me more. Um, and then it will return a result. And then I can say, okay, well, based on that, why don't you develop a plan for me specifically that, um, yeah, you know, utilizes the points that you've covered to, you know, put myself out there in a certain way. So it, it's incredible. You can talk to it in English, you can back and forth with it. You can get it to do tasks for you. And, um, conversely or similarly, I guess, um, mid journey is, is the same for images. 
I can say, um, make me a photorealistic image of a white haired man on his sailboat on Gabriola Island, surrounded by a flock of cormorants. Um, and you will start to see variations of exactly that image. And then I can go in there and actually tweak some variables um, and start to uh, express different iterations of that kind of stuff. So those are those main two tools. My background is um, I'm an artist and photographer. I spent the decade preceding the pandemic uh, traveling the world, making photos at um, some of the world's coolest events music festivals, Olympic games, fashion weeks, and all sorts of kind of TED talks, uh, stuff like that. And I guess my kind of like claim to fame is during the early blogging revolution and web 2.0, I was going around the world teaching artists and creators how they can leverage the social media tools to find their voice and build an audience and kind of connect with the world and get out there. And so I've acted as a bit of like a guide and a coach for people who are looking to embrace these new technologies, specifically creators and educators and, and stuff like that. And it's with a bit of a empathetic angle because these major changes in technology, you know, they touch everything, including our identities. And so I spent a lot of time, you know, talking to photographers and filmmakers in the mid 2000s about how they can embrace blogging and Flickr and YouTube and not be afraid of it and um, put their work and their selves out there without uh, risk or fear of being exploited or copied or stolen from. Um, so, yeah, that's my background. And I feel really lucky to be sitting where I'm sitting with that background because I believe this is going to be a pretty major tech revolution, at least as big as the mobile phone or the web browser. Um, it seems like it's truly going to change everything. You used the word tsunami the other night in a forum we're on. And I think that is, a, from what I can see, as a kind of a slight sentinel on this thing, uh, we're going to be completely subsumed, completely immersed. And it feels like a tsunami of AI. It's going to change absolutely everything. And I think yeah. it's, it's going to be bigger than as big as computing, you know, the personal computer and yeah. the internet. has. Been and it's bigger. going to happen really, really fast too, because um, all the infrastructure is already in place for it to take off. Um, this morning I set up, I spent my morning setting up a bunch of agents one of the cool things about GPT, unlike Google, where when you type in a search, it just returns you the results of that search. And it doesn't take into consideration everything you've searched for before and which of those results were right or useful and which ones were not useful. But in GPT, you can train the agent um, based on previous information to return um, specific information or results or tasks. And so... Um, I spent the morning training various instances of my AI. One, I trained it how to be a writer. And then another one, I trained how to be an editor. And I've got the writer and the editor talking back and forth to each other. So I can say, write me a story about a cabin in the woods. And the writer will, based on all the information I gave her and good writing that I fed into her, she will write me whatever I want uh, 10 paragraph nonfiction essay on a man using technology in the woods. Um, and then she passes that to the editor <laughs> who looks not only at like grammar and spelling, but also like overall sen sentence structure and, you know, story arc and stuff like that. And he suggests changes back to the writer and she integrates those and then it submits it to me for approval. Um, that's one of the agents I set up this morning. Another one is a, a critic, a reviewer and rater critic. So I have done some training about what I'm looking for. And now I can literally type a uh, one sentence string. You know, I can just say, tell me about future in review. And it'll go out and look at all the information about future in review, run some analysis and critique and write me back a mini report, essentially telling me um, what it thinks about whatever I asked it to check out. Um mm -hmm. How do you that sounds impossible? How one, do you one, one more thing I just want I want to I want to add to that, Kevin? Go ahead. Um, and it was the thing that got us on the phone here today to do this little interview. I heard a guy say this a couple nights ago in a podcast I was listening to. Um, 
because of the way this changes everything and because of the speed at which it's changing things and the fact that it significantly amplifies the power, the productivity and creativity of the people that use it, the prediction exists that the early adopters of this technology, the okay, let me just try it a different way. The people with the best AIs, the best trained AIs are going to outperform their peers. And the people that are able to quickly adopt these technologies and train them in useful ways will exponentially accelerate, accelerate their growth to such a point which their competitors within a year or two will face an insurmountable task of being able to um, you know, compete with them. Essentially that through utilizing these tools and technologies um, versus someone who's not using them, the person who is using them will accelerate their own growth in such a way that they will be unreachable in almost no time at all, um, is what some people are predicting. By unreachable, you mean unable to compete with them? Yeah, I want to take a whole nother crack at that one more time. Um, yep. I've been really interested to set up these different agents and AIs for myself because there's this idea out there that um, because of how quickly this is changing and because of how much it amplifies your personal power, by adopting these technologies um, quickly and, and putting them to work for us, we essentially will create a competitive advantage that is insurmountable within a year or two. It's like the person with the best trained AIs wins. And by adopting those now, learning from them, teaching them and training them, um, the competitive advantage that it offers might make it such that um, my peers or competitors, if you wish, are unable to keep up or ever catch up with me because I adopted them early. I don't know. So so those who are sharp and fast and young and technologically uh, adroit will kind of overwhelm all the rest of us who are list list dexing <laughs> and slow. And I don't know. I mean, that is like, like one of the fears. Rates. That is one of the fears of like inequitable distribution of these technologies. And, but and while I talk about it in a personal way, think about it in a corporate way for a second. Companies that invest in AI and train their AIs now, right now, possibly will create unsurmountable competitive advantage versus the other characters in their field within a year or two. Un, unreachable, uncatchupable. And this could be true, though, with nation states and military and... Well, and, that is uh, exactly the prediction of of doom and gloom that people say is that, you know, the countries and with the best AIs win and, um, um, you know, the advantage, the leveraged advantage of adopting them now and having them be powerful will potentially accelerate those users so far into the stratosphere that no one will ever be able to reach them. Well, you know, Chris, I know you primarily as... Uh, a creative person who is an early adopter. I think you had one of the first two two initial um, uh, Twitter handles. Twitter handles, right? Just two initials. Yeah. And um, you've always been a really early adopter, and you've been extraordinarily um, collaborative and generous with your time and energy trying to help people. I mean, that's how I met you was at a workshop and you were the one thing that was just stunning to me was how um, not only informed and skilled you were, but how willing you were to try and share and really eager and enthusiastic and compassionate about trying to share your knowledge with others to assist them to better themselves and to expand and kind of fearlessly. So, so, so I know that I think I'm trying to, temper this a little bit what you said to say that you know i know while you're competitive in a certain way i know that your primary instincts are not driven i don't think by competitiveness but by a keenness on the understanding of the importance to stay relevant which is i think also important um yeah i mean you can interpret uh my use of the word competitive advantage however you want you know if you're running a nonprofit that's trying to save the world 
uh, you know, you want to uh, succeed in that mission and these tools will help you kind of achieve your goals or whatever and right. potentially make you untouchable versus other people who are trying to accomplish the same tasks or whatever. And so I just mean to say that it is uh, empowering and it's probably important to adopt it and uh, or at least experiment with it and wrap your head around like what's going on out there. I think that's, a, a if I can use the word better emphasis or slant and more accurate i think from what i know you that um well so i want to i want to put another thing out there too um lest i seem like some sort of techno utopian or something like that um i'm not oblivious to the concerns uh raised by people about these technologies in fact i share those concerns i find it interesting that half the world is lining up on the side of um stop using this technology for six months right now moratorium and the other half of the world is like no uh we need to use this now to you know for the betterment of mankind so i can see both sides of it and um i um in fact you know to that point i don't know what to think about it all and so when in this situation i found that going to art and literature is the way to help me make sense of uh, a changing world and so, uh, you know, for 30 or 40 years now, there's an established body of science fiction, television and film that is exploring AI and kind of future realities. And so I'm pulling together um, a film festival here on Ormby Island. It's going to be the first international film festival on sci-fi and AI. It's called Artificial Nightmares. And we've got a two-day lineup of um, film and television from the last, actually the last 60 years, there's a couple Twilight Zone episodes in there too. Um, but yeah, we'll be pulling together this film festival. We're going to be sitting together watching these um, documentaries, talking about them and just, uh, you know, using art and literature to help us make sense of this fucking fast changing environment, man. Let me insert an idea. One of the things I love that I came across that I look at it probably at least once a year is Rod Serling's pitch for the Twilight Zone. Have you ever seen that? No. Look it up on Google. And it's Rod Serling's pitch for the Twilight Zone. It's exquisite. And I just was thinking. Drop it in my Discord you, server. Share it with the world. Use AI to give your pitch for your film festival. Use Rod Serling's voice and style. That's so funny, man. I literally did just that. The invite for the film festival is written in the voice of Twilight Zone. So it's like, I, mean, I could read it to you, but it sounds like a freaking Twilight Zone episode. I did exactly that. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> See the thing, think about it. I think it'd be fantastic. Yeah, I, I think that was just over the top. But I also think, as I was telling you last night, that with your film festival, maybe not this one, but to have at least some um, dialogue about this issue because you hold both sides of it so many of us do and and it's it's such an enigma you know it, it it's unknown that's why you're doing the film festival i think is because you're like this sci-fi has always dealt with like how do we deal with the unknown and the well and i'm the... so excited about these technologies on one hand and how they can help and change my personal life and that of my friends and family but i'm also not oblivious like i said to the concerns and so i'm trying to think about the ethics of it and i know other people have done so as well and i think a lot of the the thinking about these technologies has been done long before the technologies were available and ready to for us so um here's here's to hope and at least we'll it'll create a good discourse amongst my community about ai's role and our relationship to it so as you said this i'm going to be honest with you just because my mind goes there as you said that i had a vision <laughs> of future Chris and be standing in a smoldering nuclear remnant pile of the earth <laughs> and, and, and that being played back to us. Well, you know, I tell I you, we're going there, but you know, it's just like, yeah, I tell you what, of where um, we're at and what really happens kind of, you know, you know, I'll put this uh, Mia culpa here on the record a little bit. Uh, you know, I was pretty young when the web 2.0 revolution came around and I had lived through the corporatization of the first internet. Um, and as web 2.0 came out, I felt like blogging and, um, content creation and YouTube could truly liberate mankind. 
that through expressing our voices independently, uniquely and creatively on the internet, um, we could find uh, liberation. And in fact, uh, it turns out, you know, that wasn't exactly accurate. Um, many people have found some of those things along the way, but um, the corporations moved right in again and, you know, in, in some ways, you know, enslaved us digitally, so to speak. So I'm sure everyone's seen The Social Dilemma and learned about how um, algorithms and technology are um, created to exploit the differences between us. And um, really that that's a part of their their special sauce. So uh, just to say that, um, uh, well, you can't blame me if the world blows up because of AI, but I'm definitely not going to approach it from quite a positive uh positivist perspective um you know i'm not like one of the guys that believes we're gonna invent our way out of climate change um so i think the creation of technology is a unique part of what makes us human best i can tell it's all about community and our tools the things that make us human our relationship to other humans and our relationship to our tools so I don't think this is going away and I endeavor to understand it best I can and to use it um, in positive ways and to be a part of the dialogue about uh, what role we want it to play in our lives and our communities. Yeah, because you were doing that when I met you back then. And I think one of the focuses is you're, as you were then, trying to help people understand the media or the or the technologies and how to use that understanding and how to train them in it so they could better understand it and utilize it for the good and for community. Yeah, I mean I, just, I, I remember being well. at I remember being at Media That Matters on Cortez Island in like 2006 or 2007 and Probably gathered there was a bunch of filmmakers, you know, in the late stages of their career. And many of them uh while they were bona fide filmmakers um, had not made a film in five or 10 years. And in that time, everything has changed. How you make a film, how you distribute a film, um, all those components. And that was, I think, the first time I really remember feeling like a deep empathy for the identity crisis that can be caused by emerging technology. Here I was sitting in a room full of filmmakers that possessed none of the modern skills required to make a film. And I viewed myself as someone who could kind of bridge that gap, um, who could help bring them into the digital and emerging world. And um, so maybe I'll get a chance to do that again this time along as I uh, learn and play with these tools and try to create a compassionate, empathetic environment for learning. <laughs> so yesterday you mentioned to me all the ways that it, AI has changed your life just recently. The whole way you you do your job and your business and stuff. Is that something you can talk about? You touched well, on Well, I mean, my mind is still evolving, Kevin. Uh, it's really on fire right now. Like the, one of the reasons we're making this video is because I intend to put it into AI to make a text transcript of it. With that tran text transcript, I intend to have it summarize it and to write some posts and tweets about some of these ideas that we're sharing back and forth. I use AI now for research and for writing. I use it to generate um, images and thumbnails for my podcast. I use it for idea generation and vision boarding. Um, it's really touching everything right now. I think you said you use it for a business plan or a project plan. <laughs> I had to take a look at my website and my overall web presence at chriskrug.co and then look at my competitors and other people doing the same thing out there and write some reports based on what the differences were. I then had to come up with a bit of like a five-year plan for my website, including how what I should invest in technology and which technology specifically I should invest in and what the potential return on those things would be. And then I told it I wanted to bring a partner into this business. I have someone in mind. And so what information should I share with them to get this project going? And it led me through the process of creating a brief for this person. And then it wrote me a business proposal to send them and a contract where essentially, you know, we grow web revenue for me to 500K over five years. And I cut this person 20% back on the overall project over the years, you know, and stuff. So it... um 
it took me to a place that I never would have been able to go by. I could have stared at a blank spreadsheet for a thousand years and not developed the things that it developed for me in 20 seconds based on my inquiries and questions. What was the period of time that you did this in? 20 minutes. Don't mean the whole thing? Yeah. You're kidding me. It took no, me no. longer to collate the information together. You know, this is what I was telling you yesterday, man, is like so little of our lives are spent thinking, strategizing, and being creative. Those things that are truly the high value things that us humans can do. And so much time is spent admin and collating, copying, pasting, researching, and just doing bullshit things that, you know, machines are better at. So, you know, one of the promises of this stuff is, um, you know, it really has freed me up to be strategic and creative and forward thinking and visionary without the overhead of um, having to do a lot of this admin stuff. You know, it's it's amplified my power in that way. Well, and you did that, the whole litany you gave us just a couple a minute ago or something like that. That was done in a period of 24 hours or less. I said 20 minutes. I know you did, but <laughs> that yeah. true? Yeah. 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 I'm often only limited by the fact that I can only run 25 GPT-4 requests per hour. And I could upgrade that, but I think it's a good hard cap. It's usually by the time I hit my limit, it's time to get up and do something else for a little while. I'm not just yeah. a brain in a jar. But, but now this is consuming your life and time in other ways. It's using, I don't have time to keep up on just following this, this uh, server you set up. And so I have to kind of quickly try to follow what's going on. And I notice how much time you're spending and I notice how much time I'm spending, but it's pretty. I mean, I understand it's true. It has, it has uh, taken a lot of my time, but I don't have time not to. <laughs> That's why right. it's try like, this is important it and it's changing everything. And I want to be a part of that. And so, and, um, you know, while I'm spending a significant amount of time in it, it has reduced the amount of time that it takes me to do the things that I would have done or made them possible when they were not possible at all. So the value that I'm getting out of the eight or 10 hours a day that I spend out of this is exponential versus what I would have um, got out of investing eight or 10 hours in similar tasks beforehand. Chris, I just noticed that it says that we've got or I've got three minutes and three, basically three minutes left. I'm, Let's I'm say not... goodbye, man. I I need a bio break and my folks are coming into town. So I got a lot of stuff to do here. I appreciate your time though. I think this was good, Chris. Yeah, man. Really good. Will you share um, this with Bobbin? Yeah, I'll share it with Bobbin. Last thing I want to put on the record here is I'm developing a generative AI art workshop for creatives and artists and educators. It's called Genius Machine. I've got a half day module and a one day module available. We're essentially just going to explore these new and emerging AI tools and kind of like a hands on workshop. Um, we will come up with some group projects together. We'll run some experiments. We'll share our work and give feedback on it as well as talk through like the ethics of um, all these, you know, artificial intelligence technologies as it relates to copyright and intellectual property and all that kind of stuff. So keep your eyes peeled for Genius Machine Generative AI Art Workshop by Chris Krug. And if you want me to come give one at your company or in your community, just hit me up and um, we can talk more about that. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, man. Lots of love. Bye-bye.